This is The Big Jump, a podcast about human reinvention, featuring pro athletes who have leveraged their athletic minds for success beyond sports. I'm your host, David Gardner, a professional basketball player turned CEO of branding firm Color Jar. Welcome to The Big Jump, a podcast about human reinvention. As your host, I sit down with a different professional athlete each episode to hear the story of their big jump and how they've created success beyond sports. Today's guest is Super Bowl winner Ryan Mundy, an NFL safety who played his final season for the Chicago Bears, where he held the title of captain of the defense. Ryan made the big jump three years ago and is now the founder of TechLeet Ventures, a tech investment firm that has been covered by Forbes. Ryan is the guy who put up better numbers each and every year he was in the NFL, and you'll hear about the influences that shaped him to become a fierce competitor. Yeah, I'm an aggressive guy, and I go in there just trying to mix things up. In our conversation, you'll learn about the impact of having a dad that was strict and supportive and coached his youth teams, as well as playing for the high school that has produced the most active NFL players. After making three Rose Bowl appearances playing for the iconic University of Michigan, you'll learn what was so stressful that it made his hair fall out and develop a bald spot. We talk about why Ryan is suing a football helmet manufacturer, and we have a serious, in-depth, and vulnerable conversation about concussions and the resulting brain disease CTE and what actions Ryan is taking now around his brain health. You know, the impact of concussions needs to be openly addressed and acted upon, and I really feel like Ryan leads the way here by sharing his fears and perspective. And of course, you'll hear about Ryan's big jump from football to tech investing. You know, that was tough. And I'm 22 years old at that time. And I'm like, man, I don't, I have no idea where this is going to go. We discussed the pros and cons of having a plan B and if diversifying your identity before a moment of change comes your way is helpful or distracting. If you're listening while driving or perhaps juggling fire, don't worry because everything and everyone discussed is all for you on the website with comprehensive show notes. Just go to thebigjumpshow.com and we've got you covered. Along those lines, I want this podcast to become its best. And I learned from sports that feedback is love and improves performance. So give me some feedback. I want to create better content for you. So tell me what you liked. Tell me what could be better. The Big Jump is on Instagram and Twitter, both at Big Jump Show. And leave a quick review on Apple Podcasts because it helps get the word out about the mission to inspire someone's next big jump. And remember to subscribe if you like what you hear and might want more. There's a lot more in store for season one of The Big Jump and beyond. I want to say thank you to our sponsor, Grand Voyage, a luxury fashion brand and a personal favorite of mine that makes shoes and bags designed in L.A. and handcrafted in Italy. GQ says they're, quote, changing the fashion game. And I always say, if you're changing up your game, you better look the part. So use promo code THEBIGJUMP for $35 off the beautiful bags and shoes from Grand Voyage. By the way, my favorite item has got to be the blue burnished leather high tops, which are handcrafted in Tuscany, Italy. So go check them out. See what I mean? Yes, blue leather high tops. Go to thebigjumpshow.com slash shoes. And from there, as they say, the rest is up to you. Finally, I want to give a shout out to the Concussion Legacy Foundation, who is committed to protecting athletes and families by advancing the study, treatment, and effects of brain trauma in athletes and other at-risk groups. You know, I don't have a personal connection to the foundation, but they're widely considered a leading organization, so I want to use this platform to bring attention to the good work they're doing. You can go to concussionfoundation.org and please consider making a donation. And with that... I give you my inspiring conversation with Ryan Mundy. Ryan Mundy, thank you for uh, being on The Big Jump. Really excited to sit down with you today. There's a ton I want to ask you about. I'm so curious about these different aspects of of your life, your career, your professional career, how you've made the transition. But where I'd like to start is with what's your earliest memory playing sports? Well, super happy to, to be on The Big Jump. Thanks for having me, David. My earliest memory of playing sports comes in 1992. I was seven years old. That summer of 92, I told my dad I wanted to play football. And he said, all right. And I'm I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is Western Pennsylvania. And it's like the hotbed for football. You know, a lot of legendary type football players, particularly from the quarterback position, have come from the area. 
And I was very curious, had a lot of VHS experience watching guys like Dick Buckus and Walter Payton, et cetera. And I said, I told my dad I wanted to play. And so he was like, all right, cool. Let's, let's sign you up for the local team, the Sheridan Bulldogs. And I uh, went up, did my signups. And uh, the first day of practice, they handed me the number 51 jersey. And, you know, I was like, okay, I don't know what to do with this, but I'll take it and I'll put it on. And they put me on the offensive line. So I was the biggest, the fastest, the strongest kid playing offensive guard. And it was just a miserable season. We went winless the entire season. And I just remember just like kicking everybody's butt the entire season, uh, practice, always winning wind sprints and, you know, just doing Oklahoma drills and knocking folks down. But I did not get the ball. So I'm like, man, this sucks. I don't, I, we're losing every game. I'm not scoring touchdowns. I don't want to play anymore. And so the following year, my dad asked me, he said, well, do you, do you want to go back out and play football? I said, no, we didn't win the game. And I was playing on the offensive line. I don't want to do that anymore. And my dad obliged. And so the first few weeks of the season, I didn't play for the 1993 season. Uh, but fortunately, my dad, not wanting me to be a quitter, because I'm was very i very strong will. And when I make my mind up on something like, that's it, I'm not playing. But he made me get back out there. But it was under one condition. I said, if I go back out there, then I'm, I need to get the ball. I want to score touchdowns. And so we figured that out. And then uh, I've been playing ever since. What kind of a role did your dad have with you? Was he, was he hands-on? Did he encourage you? Was he strict? What was your dad like when you were a kid coming up playing football? My dad was very strict. <laughs> and he was very hands-on, which I'm extremely thankful for now as an adult. When I was going through it, it was a pain in the ass. What types of things would he do? So my dad ended up being my coach, and he always, and I mean always, knew how to press my buttons to get the most out of me. I vividly remember times where we would be out playing an actual game, and uh, me and him would be yelling back and forth on the sidelines. And I was like highly emotional, and I'd be crying, screaming, and pointing at him back and forth in between plays, and then... Once it was time to go run a play, I go knock somebody out. And then it kind of be, and then I look over and be like, are you happy now? Like, you know, gladiator, are you not entertained? That type <laughs> of stuff. Um, and I asked him about it a few years ago and he said, yeah, I just wanted, I knew how to push your buttons. And uh, I guess that was one of his ways of, of getting the best out of me. But he was always there. And I mean, always there, whether it was training, games, he always made sure that I had everything that I needed to succeed and always put me in a position to do my best. What are some of those things that you take with you today that you feel like you may have gotten from your dad? Definitely hard work, first and foremost. You know, that is uh, something that I truly believe has allowed me to have a sustainable career throughout high school, college, professionally, and something that I'm really leaning on as I, as I transition away from professional athletics. So hard work, first and foremost. Discipline, he was very stern and very strict. You know, I couldn't go anywhere if my room wasn't clean and, you know, I had to pick up my clothes and, you know, just that type of stuff. So really establishing like a system and a process to make sure I was doing things the right way all the time. When did you have an idea that you may be able to play beyond youth football, beyond high school football? When did that first become apparent to you? You know what? I never really thought about it in in that context it was always like I was enjoying the moment and I enjoy playing Pop Warner youth football and I wanted to be the best in Pop Warner youth football so it was always kind of focusing where I was and then when I got close to going to high school I was like all right well this is kind of what it looks like so now I just uh, continue to do what I did previously but do it a little bit better and I always had a physical advantage amongst my peers, because as I mentioned, I was always like bigger, stronger and faster than most folks. But um, it didn't really become apparent in like, I guess a quote dream to make it to the NFL until like my junior year of high school. That's when I really started to put things into context. Uh, I got an offer from the University of Michigan and things started to really take shape. And it was like, all right, well, you know, maybe there's, there's something here I, and you know, I could make a professional career out of it. You played for a, a legendary high school program. <laughs> and um, I saw an interview that uh, your coach 
George Novak gave. Uh, and this is another uh, a common point I discovered uh, between us. I, I played for a legendary high school program. My coach was also named Novak. Wow. <laughs> Small world. <laughs> uh, I'm, I, I don't believe there's any relation, uh, but I can imagine a bit what that experience was like. I saw you were the high school with the most active NFL players yep. during the time at which you played seven, including Gronkowski. Mm -hmm. You know, something that struck me in the interview I saw with uh, your old coach, Coach Novak, was he said, Ryan is one of my all-time favorites, an unbelievable athlete, and more importantly, an unbelievable leader. How does that feel, hearing those words? Uh, that means a lot to me. Because we've had, throughout my high school, we've had a lot of good players who, you know, obviously have played in the NFL, but... We had a lot of legendary high school athletes as well. So to hear those words come from uh, my coach, who's one of the probably most respected high school football coaches in not only Western Pennsylvania history, but in Pennsylvania football history, it means a lot. What do you think he saw in you? I think I've always just been very mature for my age, even in high school and middle school. Like, you know, I wasn't always just like, grab ass in or, you know, doing the boys will be boys type thing. I was always kind of like very mature throughout my youth and adolescence. And I think that, you know, the adults at that time kind of appreciated that. Uh, so I guess I was always just, that always role always just fell on me. And I think my coach appreciated that. You started your career playing football at University of Michigan mm -hmm. and you're there three years. Four. Four years. Yeah. Yep. And three Rose Bowl appearances. Mm -hmm. And then you transferred. Tell me about how that came to be. Coming out of high school, went to the University of Michigan. I played my freshman year, did not redshirt. Sophomore year, started all 12 games, including the Rose Bowl. We lost to Vince Young. He scored five rushing touchdowns, by the way, not passing, five <laughs> rushing touchdowns. It was uh, pretty incredible. And then the following year, my junior year, you know, super high expectations, had a lot of experience under my belt, full confidence of the coaching staff. I get injured during training camp and it was just a routine tackling drill, lost all feeling and sensation in my left arm. And, you know, it was pretty devastating because I had such high, high expectations for the season. So I was faced with a decision. Do I try to go back out there and play or do I red cert this year? Because the information that was given to me by the doctors was, well, you could try to go play, but if it happens to this magnitude again, we're not going to clear you. So with that information in mind, I was like, well, I guess I'm not playing this year. Very disappointing for myself and also the staff. But during that season, I fell into the doghouse with the coaching staff. And there, you know, there really wasn't no good reason for it. I was told to rest and recover for the season, meaning no contact. And I was out there practicing. So that was pretty disappointing and it just didn't make sense to me and you know the coach is talking about you know I don't know if I'm going to give you a scholarship because scholarship is renewable every year you know you think you sign up for four or five years but they renew that bad boy every year and you know I knew he played this tactic with other potential fifth year seniors but and they all came back but something within me said you know what like man F this I'm out and I learned about the graduate transfer rule so here I am, you know, preparing to leave, graduate, pack my bags and everything. And I found out that the rule that I was going to use was no longer in existence. Wow. Yeah. So um, that you want to talk about just like my heart sinking to the ground. I was like, man, what am I going to do? Um, then I started thinking about, well, should I just go into the draft? I was like, no, nah, I can't do that because I got an extra year of eligibility left. I didn't really have a great season and I need to, you know, maximize this opportunity. And I didn't want to leave a stone unturned. So I wrote letters of appeal. I had numerous phone calls and was just with the NCAA. I was just kind of in purgatory in this abyss for like four months. And during that time frame, I'm working out at the student rec center. You know, that was tough. And I'm 22 years old at that time. And I'm like, man, I don't, I have no idea where this is going to go. And it was like super stressful, so much so that I developed alopecia. My hair was falling out. I developed a bald spot. And I'm like, man, I'm 22 years old. My hair is falling out. This is insane. But thankfully, 
you know, the 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 uh, letters of appeal, everything worked in my favor. And I got um, word that I was eligible to transfer with with no setbacks. And then two weeks later, I was in Morgantown, West Virginia, signing up for classes and working out in their weight room. Amazing. Yeah. And so then you you went to graduate school at West Virginia. What did you study? There was a stipulation with the graduate transfer rule that the athlete had to transfer to an institution that offered a graduate program that was not offered at the previous institution. So I had to find, <laughs> so I had to find this loophole. I was like, Found the loophole. What does West Virginia have as a graduate major that Michigan doesn't have? Athletic coaching. Boom. Got it. And it ended up working out tremendously. I had a great season at West Virginia. All we had to do was beat Pitt, and we were going to the national championship. Pitt's going home regardless if they win or lose. We're going to the national championship. We got there and we lose to Pitt 13 to 9. But we ended up going to the Fiesta Bowl, won that at West Virginia, beat beat the brakes off of Oklahoma. And then it was funny because I did my pre-draft training at Michigan. Because all those guys that were at West Virginia and I really liked their training program, I was like, hey, I'm just going to go back up there and start training with those guys. So it worked out. So it was really a case of hitting an achievement, then thinking about what's next and raising the bar and continuing to do that and, and progress for yourself. You know, I saw that pattern uh, with your NFL statistics where you seem to get better every year that you were in the league and your final uh, full season with the Bears from an individual statistics standpoint was your strongest, uh, where you led the team in tackles, interceptions, breakups, and you were the defensive captain. I'm wondering if that role that you played on that team was a corporate job description, (laughs) how would you describe the role that you played? What were your responsibilities and what were the skills you needed to perform the role if this were listed in corporate America? Wow. That is a unique question that I've never really put in a context. And particularly for that season, my roles and responsibility and I guess a job title, I think would be like managing director of the defense. As you mentioned, uh, I put up some really good numbers that season, but that was my seventh year in the NFL. And, um, Definitely an established veteran, had come from a a pedigree of learning from folks like Troy Palomalu, Ryan Clark, great coaches like Dick LeBeau, uh, Mike Tomlin. And really, that was my opportunity to to put on display everything that I had learned the previous six seasons. When I had that opportunity, I, I took it very serious. And going back to me being in my seventh year, some of those guys that were on that team, you know, I started to ask them a little bit. I'm like, hey, man, how old are you? And, you know, when were you born? And some of those guys were saying 1992. And I'm like, dude, I started playing football in 1992. And that's when you realize, like, hey, like, I am the senior leadership around here. And with that senior leadership comes a lot of accountability and responsibility to get the younger guys in line and make sure, making sure that you're doing a great job of, of preparing them to have sustainable and successful NFL careers. So as managing director of the defense, uh, (laughs) what were, is there a specific example that comes to mind of where you had to do the tough work of uh, getting someone to fall in line? Yeah. As a safety, the number one skill set or characteristic or job requirement would be communication and making sure that, you know, I, I get the other safety, the call, the cornerbacks, the call, I receive the call from the sideline or the linebacker, whether that be Lance Briggs or whoever else was on the field and making sure that everybody's on the same page. Because if the cornerback does not get the call, it could be disastrous. And we had some disastrous plays that season. And I'm not a finger pointer. So if it wasn't my fault or if it wasn't my fault, like I've, whenever the microphone was in my face, I always took accountability. And then, you know, we would have to go back and, and discuss it and try to fix it and rectify the situation amongst our team. But, you know, it's it's a it's very important to show a united front in the media. As part of that job description, what was required from you physically? Wow. <laughs> Every sport's different. Yeah. There are different wears and tears and, and, and strains and demands sport by sport. How would you think about the physical requirements of being a safety in the NFL? It is quite frankly brutal. The 2016 season 
or excuse me, the 2015 season, uh, I had, I was on injured reserve and I didn't, I didn't play because I had back surgery and I would be watching the games literally on TV. And I said, wow, that looks like it hurts. And that was the first time that I had ever thought that in my life, because as a safety, you're literally coming across every position on the offense, offensive side of the ball. One play, I could be covering Rob Gronkowski. And then the next play, I could be in cover two and have to go break up a pass thrown to Julio Jones. And then the next play, I might have to make an open field tackle on Adrian Peterson. And then the following play, I may have to blitz and come off the edge and, and try to uh, tackle the quarterback. And another play, take on a 350-pound tackle who's running with a full head of steam. So, you know, you have to be agile and quite flexible and have a, a certain level of grit, toughness, and determination to get the job done because literally on any given play, you could come across a variety of different body types and uh, positions. So the helmet, the key protective device for folks like you who put themselves in um, very dangerous situations repeatedly, uh, week in, week out, year in, year out. I saw a TED talk by a Stanford professor who said that helmets are engineered to protect against skull fracture, not to protect against concussions. Mm. Wow. And you were in the NFL during a time where the conversation around concussions started to get significant traction and really reach a boiling point. Players were uh, having mental issues and in waves committing suicide. Dave Duerson, Ray Easterling, Junior Seau, and they were doing it in a way where they were shooting themselves in the chest so that their brains could be examined to see what was going on and what effects football may have had on their brain. What was it like to have that going around and then walk on the field, put your helmet on? The guys that I entered into the NFL with and prior to uh, the guys who had, were older than me, they played football a different way and had a different paradigm about football where it was like, you know, if you get your bell rung, get back up and get back in there. And we didn't really know what a concussion was. And we did not know what CTE was. And we did not know there was no such thing as helmet to helmet. And you did not get fined for that. So I that's how I grew up playing football all the way up into literally my rookie, yeah, my rookie year in, in, the, in the NFL where things started to change a little bit. The conversation started to change. And that was in 2008 where you literally started to see guys laying on the field frozen, arms up, not moving. That is a scary image. And once that started to happen, then the conversation had to change drastically because no longer was it, you know, on paper or by word of mouth, but people were visually seeing these images on the field. And as a young guy, for me, you know, starting my career, I had to think about, okay, well, you know, this is, I've been doing this for my entire life. And you kind of get built up into this invincible me type of mindset where like, okay, that happened to that guy, but I'm still, I still have to do what I have to do. And it, the likelihood of it happening to me, eh, but I'm still going to go out there and play. So as we move forward from 2008 and later on into my career, I had to start changing how I tackle people because once those images started coming out and the uproar started coming and we had the movie concussion, like the NFL started finding people. I got fined over a hundred thousand dollars for quote, helmet to helmet hits, but it wasn't malicious or I wasn't out there trying to hurt people, but you know, I, I had a job to do. So how do you balance that dynamic, right? If a guy catches the ball over the middle, I can't control how he moves. I'm not targeting his head, but I may inadvertently hit his helmet. Am I trying to injure him? No. Will there be some residual effects from the hit? Maybe. Will there be immediate effects from the hit? Maybe. Like I've hit guys where they've been knocked out. And it wasn't because I tried to knock them out, but because I had to do a job, right? And so you you have to, it's a it's an interesting dynamic, particularly for safeties to manage because the air traffic and the rate of speed, it, it, there can be a lot of violent collisions, but... Throughout the locker room, I don't really think the conversation revolved around 
you know, like, hey, man, I'm scared. I, I might have CTE. Like, I never really got that from guys throughout the locker room, even with, you know, cases like Junior Seau and Dave Durson and, and, and the others. Like, we never really openly discussed that in the locker room. And, you know, I've been out of the locker room for almost three years now, so I don't know what the conversation is like today. But through 2008 all the way up until 2015, that was never really – uh, something that was like openly discussed. And what do you make of that? Uh, man, it's not good, right? Because football is a very, uh, again, a very violent game, but it's this dynamic that the guys manage of saying, all right, well, I know this is dangerous, but I can also make a lot of money doing this. And this is what I've been doing my entire life. And this is what I know. So, you know, actively managing that dynamic. And I think a lot of it has to do with like age too and experience. So as a, as a 24 year old or a 23 year old, I'm not thinking, I wasn't thinking the same way that I'm thinking today as a 33 year old. It's much different. As I mentioned before, like in 2015, when I literally looked at the screen and said, wow, that looks like it hurts. That I was doing that my entire life. Right. But then I, all of a sudden I just realized that, oh, well now it looks like it hurts. And, you know, potentially the damage is already done. So, um, you know, at, as a, it's a young man's game. And when you're out there with fresh legs and a fresh body and, you know, moving fast and feeling good, you know, you don't really have that perception of like, oh, I'm not going to be like this one day. You know, I'm not always going to be this fast and I'm not always going to be this strong. You know, today I, I got out the bed, my back is hurting, my feet are hurting, my knees hurt. You know, you don't really feel that those residual effects until, they hit a critical mass and that's through the accumulation of blow after blow after blow. Damage is done. Yeah. yeah. You have a wife, you have two daughters, beautiful girls. Do you think about CTE? Do you think about what if? Do you think about the damage is done? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I thought about it. Absolutely. And it's something that is, you know, very concerning because there's no way to properly diagnose CTE in a living body. Like CTE is only diagnosed post-mortem, which is very scary. And, you know, they have some symptoms out there or some warning signs that maybe, you know, you could, you could look out for, but what are some of those symptoms, you know, thoughts about harming yourself or harming others. I think uh, some restlessness and, and, and insomnia, you know, just, just, improper thoughts in general, you know, the slight paranoia and, and, and stuff like that, I think are some of the warning signs. But uh, for me, I've always just tried to, to keep my brain active and healthy, which I think is really important. So like I have like these brain games that I do and, you know, just to try to stay sharp because, you know, those blows after blows after blows, those are, you know, taking a toll. You know, and it may not be CTE. It may be some other form of disease. It may be a ALZ or, you know, some something else. But, you know, you have to start taking care of your brain just as much as you're taking care of your body because that's essentially the most important part of your body is your brain. Then guys spend hundreds of thousands of dollars getting massages and acupuncture and, and chirotherapy and training, right? That's all for the body. But what are you doing for your brain? So once I started to think a little bit differently, I started to invest in my brain a little bit more. Mm. Thanks for sharing all that. Yep. I really admire your, your vulnerability and appreciate you opening up about that subject. Thank you. Yep. Um, I saw a headline that you sued a helmet manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the headline, I assumed it was going to have something to do with concussions, but that wasn't the story at all. What happened? Yeah. So, um, uh... That case is still pending, but it was the third preseason game of 2014 while I was here with the Bears. As I mentioned, when I said that I literally come across every position on the offensive side of the ball, well, on this particular play, I had to take on a fullback who was about 60 pounds heavier, heavier than me, and my responsibility was to take on the fullback with my inside shoulder so that the running back would not be able to go outside of me. And so, um, you know, I'm an aggressive guy and I go in there just trying to mix things up. And it was a very violent co collision. 
And upon impact, my helmet was, I guess, not jarred, but it, it kind of came down uh, on my brow. And there was there was a pad within the, the helmet that had a perforated edge, plastic edge, that literally sliced my face. And I received 17 stitches wow. on my face. Yeah. Wow. So I read five and a half inch gash. Yeah. Can you see it? I can see it. You're yeah. a good looking guy. I see the scar. <laughs> you know, I think it adds a little toughness to the, right. to the pretty face. Yeah. Um, but I can imagine, uh, actually from personal experience, I don't need to imagine of how difficult actually traumatic that is. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a crazy thing happen to me where a barber swung his shears while cutting my head and slashed open my scalp and I got seven staples. And I remember going... Wow through that and being really just thrown off and concerned and what's it going to look like. Right. It was a tough thing to go through. I was actually surprised at how tough it was for me to go yeah. through it. And that was in my scalp, but I thought, okay, well I give speeches and I make presentations and things like that. Right. I got, you know, the hairline's holding strong now, but yeah. who knows what yeah. happens in the wow. future. Man, that's um, crazy. So like, what was that like for you? I mean, just as a, as a person that's tough. Um, and one thing that struck me, I read some of the comments, you know, this made news, Mm -hmm. right? You suing a a helmet manufacturer and just the complete lack of empathy in these comments where it was clear that people did not see you as a person and that they were just objectifying you as a a privileged athlete. And what are you trying to do? Make a little more money? Or are you one of those guys who went broke and now you're doing this because of, you know, a lawsuit and, Mm -hmm. They, it was clear they weren't seeing you. What was that like? Just that whole thing, I'd imagine, is more than a headline. Mm-hmm. That had to be a very difficult experience for you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do not check the comment section, but I can, you know, I could definitely relate and understand, you know, how what the public perception of of that is. But let's put it in context, right? So, football is a violent game. Yes. Within that game, you wear protective equipment. And the key key word in that statement is protective. And so when my helmet, which is supposed to protect me, enters my face and causes me to get 17 stitches, that's a very atypical type situation that is not supposed to happen. The most important piece of uh, equipment that uh, a football player wears is the helmet. And for that helmet to cause an injury, you know, that's not okay. And I don't care if, you know, it's a high school athlete or if it's a collegiate athlete or if it's myself or if it's Tom Brady who makes money hand over fist, it doesn't matter. When something like that happens, you know, there needs to be action taken, right? And it's not about, you know, being a privileged athlete or anything like that, but that's that's literally a wrong that that has taken place. And I think just from fans and, you know, social commentary, you know, that's that's commonplace where athletes are not looked at as human beings. Like, you know, people aren't thinking about, you know, my two daughters or my wife or, you know, my family. Like they just see me as, oh, a guy who I see him on Sundays, sometimes Thursdays, sometimes Mondays, and he runs into people. And he should be thankful for running into people because he gets paid a nice salary to run into people. And if anything bad happens to him during the course of that, oh, well, we don't feel bad for him. Like, that's not cool, right? I'm a human being. I'm a person. I have feelings. When my face got cut, that was traumatic. And, you know, as I mentioned, I'm still working through it, but it's it's just not okay. You know, folks, I think sometimes lack empathy because they're looking more towards the dollar sign and not the person. Right. How did you decide to uh, go to business school? Oh, uh, well, I knew that, you know, I was making good money, but I wasn't making like top 10 safety money. So I was like, all right, well, want to do something with my life after I'm done playing. And at what point were you starting to have these thoughts? Probably after I had my first child. Which was what uh, career year number for you? Five. Yeah, five. 2012. And around that time, I started the NFL. They offered these programs at various universities. I went to a program at Wharton, an executive education program there. 
I saw you also went to one at Notre Dame. Yep. And so these are programs offered by the NFL that any player can go and take courses and the NFL is paying. Or you get reimbursed. You get reimbursed. Yeah, so it's tuition reimbursement. And how many people take advantage of that? Not enough. Not enough. The sad reality is that participation is so low, a few of these programs aren't in existence anymore. And that's very discouraging because, as I just mentioned, you get reimbursed for your tuition. So it makes sense. Why wouldn't you go? I wanted to make sure that I could hit the ground running. And I saw an opportunity to get my education while I was still an active athlete. I knew I was going to get reimbursed for a portion of the tuition. So I said, let's do it. So that was the first taste that really got you thinking about more education and graduate level education uh, around business. And then did you enroll in business school while you were an active player? Yeah. Yeah, I was an active athlete. The program at Miami, it was a hybrid program where I spent two weeks in class and then there was an online component. Did you know of other players who had enrolled in graduate school while? Yeah, there's quite a bit. So So that specific program was for NFL athletes. So I was in class with a lot of my former teammates and guys that I had played against and yeah, known for a long time. So it was nice to be around some like-minded guys who had the same aspirations of being more than an athlete. That's great. Yeah. And I read that you had a goal to play 10 years in the NFL, but it didn't work out that way. How did you deal with that? Yeah, it came to an end very drastically. You know, heading into that 2015 season, I didn't think that that would be my last season on the NFL roster. So I go to training camp in a position battle and I have a back injury, feel a pop in my back and it was not normal and kind of go through it uh, for a few more days. And I start to have this like killer pain shooting down my leg and ended up being inside nerve pain, had a herniated disc and ended up having to have surgery to start the season in uh, September of 2015. And I sat out that entire year. It was the last year of my contract. And going back to that time when I was on the couch and I looked at the TV and I said, wow, that looks like it hurts. Man, my paradigm started to shift big time. For the first time, I'm injured. I'm over 30 years old. I'm not moving around and and feeling good. And I'm thinking about the game differently. And just the interest and desire is just different. And that was a lot for me to try to overcome. I knew I could go out there and play football, but once it came time for me to start getting back into shape and and training again, it was just a different experience. Do you remember when you had the moment where you realized, hey, I think this is over? I was holding on, not holding on, I was like self-sabotaging, to be very honest. Like I would go to the gym and work out, I'd be there, but... I really wasn't there. And it wasn't like I didn't make a definitive decision to say, all right, well, I'm done. And I had fired my agent and I was just kind of in limbo. I didn't go get a new agent, but I was still like, yeah, I'm probably going to play. I don't know. And then the real the real test was, because I knew teams were going to start calling me. And when they did start calling me and I started saying no, like, oh, I'm kind of, I'm okay right now. That's when I knew I was like, man, this is kind of real. I may not be playing football anymore. And, you know, it was it was hard for me to to literally say no, but I had to say no going back to that self-sabotage because I wasn't ready. So it was like, like your unconscious mind knew before your conscious yeah. mind could kind of put it together and stand by it. Because I knew folks, you know, going back to my, my 2014 season, like I played really well. So like somebody's going to be interested. And if nothing else, I could run down and cover kicks. That's what I knew I could do. And I could get paid for that, but I didn't want to do it. It wasn't. It wasn't interesting. It wasn't enough money. It was just, it was time. And I was like, man, what am I going to do? Because I've seen this movie over and over again where guys and sometimes girls in different sports transition away from something that they've done for a very long time and have no idea what to do with their life. And it's tough, right? Because it's all encompassing. So you know, like, this is what I'm doing. I accomplished my life goal at 23 and I had a sustainable career for eight years. And it's like, okay, well, what's next? Like I'm 32 years old. What am I going to do next? And the natural thought process for a lot of guys and sometimes female athletes is because I've done this for an extended period of time during my life, I should just go into coaching or I should go into media and go on TV and talk about 
my former professional sport or go on the radio and talk about that. And I think that's that's very limiting. And I didn't want to do that. So it's like, okay, well, how do you figure out how to leverage that into a new context? I mean, this was around a time where like Kobe Bryant had launched a venture fund. Right. Guys like uh, Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, Andre, Andre Iguodala, like they were making headlines about being angel investors and tech investors and such. And I was like, okay, that seems cool. But, you know, like I don't have the balance sheet that those guys got. So what does this look like for me? When I when I set, decided to get involved, I was like, man, okay, well, I need to figure this out. So I've, I took a very tangible approach and almost took like baby steps. So I'm on a computer Googling like, you know, what's a term sheet? And, you know, give me the metrics of a convertible note, really just hardening myself and building up my acumen. But it was it was a it was a lot to take in, and I I literally drank from the fire hose. It was all intensive, but um, it was definitely worth it for me. Were you doing a lot of this education on your own, or did you find other people like you know role models, or how did you go about sort of the lone wolf versus you know being in the community? Yeah, and that's honestly something that I struggle with. It's like I'm a doer, and like I'll just go do stuff. If I want something done, I go do it. And I sometimes have a problem asking for help, which is something I'm actively working on now. But when I got started, I knew I could curate interests, particularly via LinkedIn and social channels. So literally I would be sending out 20, 30 cold messages a day to different investors, not only in Chicago, but across the country. And I started to notice that like, man, my hit rate is like, 85, 90%. Why do you think it was so high? Because I used to play football. <laughs> That's exactly that. But that was okay. That was, that was, that was fine. And literally, and uh, sometimes in the subject line, I would say Ryan Mundy, Chicago Bears. You know, that's like a headline attention grabber. You'll open the email. But understanding that, okay, that would get me in the door. But now I needed to come with some substance and I need to be able to pivot the conversation and really take something away and extract value from the conversation. So I became a professional coffee drinker for <laughs> <laughs> about three months, literally just connecting with folks like, hey, can I have 30 minutes of your time to learn what you do? And a lot of folks were very gracious in, in sitting down with me and probably they had no idea what what I wanted from them or what or they knew what to expect. but they took the time to, to spend with me. So I was super thankful for that. What did that feel like when you first put the signal out to the world, I'm an investor now, right? That's almost a, a totally new identity for you to adopt. Do you remember like the first time those words came out of your mouth? Uh, it was scary. <laughs> <laughs> I had just wrapped up my MBA and I had retired all the, within a, from the NFL, all within a two and a half week span. Wow. Yeah, it's it's hard, you know, because I've been, as I mentioned, I started playing football in 1992 and I stopped playing in 2016. That's a long time to do anything. And, it, you know, I've built up tons of value and, and credibility and relationships and I guess a quote brand because I was a football player. And then it's like, okay, well, how do I leverage all of that to, to propel me to where I want to go and for Ryan Monday 2.0? And that's, and that's, that was a huge challenge and something I'm still working on today. Do you feel like when you were sitting down for those coffees, were people seeing you for you or were they seeing the image of what was in your subject line? I think it was both. And initially it was probably the subject line, but I think I've developed the skill to, to one, have the intuition to understand what the, uh, the ethos is coming across from the table. And if, you know, if somebody wants to talk to me about the Super Bowl or the number one question is like, how's Jay Cutler or that type of stuff? Like I could, I'll do that with you for like a minute and a half, two minutes, but there has to, as I mentioned, there's going to be a pivot, like where like I'll come into the meeting prepared. I'll ask you about your firm, you know, some thoughts about your investments and tell you what I'm up to. And then I'll pivot the conversation away from there. So, you know, it, it varies. And I, I just have to go into pretty much every interaction open and take a feel for it and then understand where I need to to pivot, twist and turn from there. Super interesting. I had some similar experiences when I was coming off 
of playing pro basketball in Europe. And I remember being in my first business meetings, people would want to talk basketball with me. Mm -hmm. And I so desperately wanted to be seen as a business guy. Um, and I valued my athletic past, but I was ready for people to see me in a new way. Uh, so that story of pivoting the conversation, that's a very familiar one. And I noticed on your LinkedIn profile, which, you know, you said it's the sport of venture investing. What of what you're doing now after playing feels like sport to you? Everything. (laughs) (laughs) Um, that, and, and that was, uh, a phrase that was given to me by a close family friend who said, you know what, you need to figure out your new sport. When I officially decided to retire from the NFL, business to me, and particularly investing, has a lot of similarities uh, from competitive sport. And some of the adjectives that I just previously mentioned from uh, discipline, uh, you know, sticking to your investment thesis, focus, uh, which is very similar to discipline, being agile, being able to evaluate different opportunities. So mental agility is extremely important and being able to see things that aren't necessarily right in front of you and having a a strong level of anticipation is critically important and having that, that long vision because investing is quote, a a long game uh, for the most part. So you want to see not things as they are right now, but what can they be two, three, four, five years from now? Uh, so that's very similar to like play recognition. So I see something right now and there are some signals and cues that will tell me what is going to happen and they haven't happened yet, but there's a strong probability that things will go this way because of some of the signals that I read pre-snap, you know, just the, the grit, it's not easy. And particularly I'm a one man shop right now and I'm using my own capital and I'm doing my own due diligence and I'm out pounding the pavement drumming up deals that takes grit and it takes a, a lot of heart to to get up day in and day out and say all right I have to do I have to evaluate this deal I have to go through my emails I have to set my calendar invites I do all of that so that level of grit and going back to that core value that that my father taught me hard work those are things that I I rely on on a day-to-day basis now you mentioned evaluating deals how many deals did you evaluate before you made your first investment? I got a good piece of advice to to look at at least 200. Wow. Yeah. And I was like, man, how, how the hell am I going to find 200 deals? Because I, I don't even know how to, I didn't know how to drum up deals. I had literally just started. How did you drum up deals? I just had to start going to uh, like accelerators. I spent time in 1871, going to like demo days, tapping into my LinkedIn network, and going to conferences, I mean, all of the above. And really, and it was some part of it was kind of like waving a checkbook saying, hey, I'm investing now, right? So on my LinkedIn profile, I had to put investor. And on my Twitter profile, I, you know, I said, I'm doing venture investing and kind of curating and, and letting people know what I was up to. I mean, that's that's the the key, right? If people don't know what you're doing, there's they don't know how to interact with you or they don't know how to help you. Uh, so that that level of and that's a constant theme communication, letting people know, you know, hey, this is what I'm doing uh, was, I think, very uh, critical for me getting started. Right. And looking at, you know, these deals that you're evaluating, I've heard investors talk about focusing on the people, the idea and the market. What type of markets are you looking in? Uh, can you tell me more about the investment thesis and what sectors you're digging into? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And those things will change too. The market will change and the idea will change. You know, when I got started, the market was kind of pushed on me and I didn't do a good job with the name because the name suggests that I'm only involved in sports technology, tech lead ventures, right? And my background, oh, you're an athlete. Oh, you should do tech deals in sports. Good opportunity. But me just being intellectually curious, I looked at, I look at everything. What types of things, I'd like to hear more about the everything, but I'm also curious because there are interesting things happening in sports as well. What types of sports technology uh, were you evaluating or are you evaluating that's caught your eye? Yeah, so sports tech is broken down into uh, a few sectors. So data and analytics, primarily used for like on-field type stuff. 
how fast is this guy running? What's his rate of acceleration, deceleration, training methods, active recovery, programming, that type of stuff, you know, fan engagement, digital media strategies, you know, how can, how can, uh, you know, you get the game to fans and consumers in an efficient manner uh, so that you keep them coming back. Wearables, which kind of flows into data and analytics is a, uh, is definitely an opportunity. Esports, major Twitch, Fortnite, all this stuff is like just going bananas right now. Stadiums of the future. So infrastructure is really interesting. And, you know, the new technologies that are put in, and that feeds into data, uh, excuse me, digital media strategies like AR, VR, that type of stuff. Ticketing. Uh, there's just a laundry list of things that that go into sports um, that ultimately can have different use cases in in a, in a broader context. But I think there is a there's something to be said for new type of opportunities or industries where like you have to see things that aren't always there and know how to guide that company in the right direction so that it can be successful. So yeah, I think it's a new frontier. I think the the opportunity is massive. And as we move forward, we'll start to see a lot of these wearables and particularly around data and analytics, because it's all about quantifying the athlete and moving forward. Those will be critically important as we move towards a, a more healthier society and going back to like CTE. How can we understand that better? How can we understand, you know, if Ryan takes, if he makes a hundred tackles a season, as opposed to 80 tackles a season, how is this affecting his body? What does this training regimen need to be around that? I mean, all these things, just aggregating that data set and understanding what that means is going to be a tall task. But I think those type of insights will will lead to a better post-career lives for, for a lot of professional athletes. I really like the way you've uh, approached that where you, know, you went from being athlete to then having the spark of an idea where you want to figure out what it takes to become Ryan, the investor, and you started within a, a familiar sector, sports. Um, and, and thank you for the breakdown, by the way. It's really a thoughtful way and, and helpful and clarifying for me to think about sports tech with those different segments, which I can see some of the interrelatedness of them, but also the key differences, you know, between data and wearables and so on. But I'm also getting the sense that now that you have learned kind of the, the blocking and tackling of investing and you've applied that then within the sports sector that you're almost, it sounds, I was getting a hint of like that you're feeling boxed in by only <laughs> doing it within sports. Yeah. Is that like yeah. part of your identity where you're still craving to be seen more as athlete and you feel like you're not getting that by only investing in sports companies? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the world is much bigger than a playing surface or a stadium. And I want to explore that, right? So now I get a lot of sports tech opportunities that come across my desk just for the simple fact of my previous profession and what I'm, and what I'm doing now. But I spend the bulk of my time in cryptocurrency and blockchain mm -hmm. and, and really learning about that industry and ecosystem and connecting with some really bright minds in the space and just really craving to learn. That is really interesting to me. So I, that's where I've been spending the bulk of my time. And as we continue to move forward, now it's about, okay, well, if I'm really interested in that space and then let me figure out how to connect the thing that I'm really interested in with the thing I have a lot of experience in. One of the things I admire about your transition story uh, is the way that you began to develop a plan B during really the prime of your career. Uh, I've noticed that a lot of athletes don't want to even think about a plan B because they feel it might distract them from plan A, right? Being a pro athlete. Right. How did that work for you? You know, sometimes I, I wonder if that was the right move. Everything happens the way it should, but just kind of going back to that laser focus and like, man, hey, I'm putting all my chips right here and I'm focusing exclusively on being the best athlete that I can right now to maximize this opportunity that's not going to come around again. You know, I think about that from time to time. But, you know, I'm extremely happy with the way that things worked out. But it's frustrating sometimes because you, you know, as a competitive athlete, you know, you look at some of the contracts that are being signed. You're like, what? They paid that guy X amount of dollars? I know I'm better than this guy, two times better than this guy on my worst day. And that's what they gave him. Um, so, you know, that 
whether you want to call it jealousy or competitive, whatever it is, right? Those those thoughts kind of enter your mind. And sometimes, well, not anymore, but like back then I would be thinking like, man, should I just like go all in? But it wasn't, it was never me thinking about hedging my bets. Um, it was just more so me just kind of following my interests and where where things were kind of leading me. Um, but it's not, it's not binary. Like you don't have to, you know, say I'm all in for football and I can't learn accounting or I'm all in for football and I can't start investing in businesses. Like you could do both, right? It just takes focus, time allocation and resources, right? And and, and it doesn't, it should not be you doing everything, right? If you want to have interests, business interests and be involved in that space, then you build a team around that and you will be exposed to that type of stuff while you're taking care of your business on the field. It's not, it does not have to be binary where it says, oh, well, I'm just a football player and I can't do anything else. That is definitely not the case. It's really just other interests. You know, you're more than a football player. You have other interests and who are you to shut those interests down? Right. And I think the thing that could be helpful in transitions is the idea of uh, not losing focus, but diversifying one's identity. So it's the, it's not the either or it's the both. And I'm a football player and uh, I'm a budding investor. And you started to develop that for yourself along the way. Do you think that helped when you realized, okay, this, this first act of professional life for me being an athlete is over. It's time for me to transition. Do you think having a diversified identity helped ease some of the difficulty of that? Yeah, I I think it did, but it was still nonetheless difficult, right? Because in that transition, you're literally reallocating because now that diversity that you had, you know, you're losing a part of that, we'll call it a portfolio because a certain percentage of that portfolio required was allocated to me being an athlete and and playing professionally. But now during that transition where now I'm, overweight in in a certain category, whether it's business interests or next career or whatever you want to call it, and I'm no longer an athlete, there's still a lot of shock and awe that needs to be worked through. It is still a definite uh, a challenge for sure. Sure. What's your happy place? <laughs> uh, my children are my happy place. I have two small children. Ryan Taylor is six and uh, Cameron is three. And, you know, I could be having a a really, really bad day or really stressful, but, you know, whenever they come home from, from preschool and usually I'm downstairs down here, uh, working on the computer, whenever I see their face, like everything stops and I get, get, get a hug and a kiss from them. And that, you know, recharges me and that gives me just a, a euphoric feeling that, um, you know, just can't be duplicated. So, um, you know, my children, uh, far and away are my happy place. If you could design your perfect day, what does that look like? What time do you wake up? What happens next? I try to live my perfect day <laughs> right now, but uh, my per- I get up at 5, 5.15-ish. My perfect day, I get up earlier than that, but that's a, that's a challenge. So perfect day is getting up at like 4.30, 4 o'clock, working out for about an hour and some change. Um, what type of workout? That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, now, like, I got the Peloton behind you, uh, so I hop on that. Um, I don't train as hard as I used to train. I don't need to do that anymore. But just as long as I'm keeping the body moving for a good hour, getting a good sweat in, getting a great breakfast, getting dressed. And this is all before my kids are, you know, before they wake up, getting them, and then getting them up, getting them ready for their day. I drop my daughter off at school, and then uh, I'm back here by 8.30, or I head to the city, and just really just hammering home on, you know, the day's work, whether that's evaluating deals, uh, having meetings, having phone calls, going to the bank to send the wire, uh, whatever it is, um, you know, just really just handling business in a very efficient manner. And then also still, you know, trying to find find some nice time within the day for me to talk to my wife or maybe grab a nice lunch with her. That would be a, an ideal day. And pick the kids up and, you know, they're pretty rambunctious and wild when they come home. So an ideal day would be for them to just be kind of cool and, 
hang out. We'll read a book or go outside and play. But yeah, you know, just it's very family oriented and uh, but also with a, a strong allocation towards work. And to me, and you referenced the painting, you know, like the the heart and, and money, that's something that I think about quite a bit because, you know, I love my family to death, but, you know, we got to this place because I put in work. And, you know, my kids go to school that they go to because I put in work. And, you know, we live a nice life because I put in work. So I always want to make sure that I have the appropriate mindset regarding that so that I could keep that edge moving forward, which I think is critically important. But then also, you know, still making sure that I'm keeping things in perspective and not just working myself to the bone and making appropriate time for family and friends. Beautiful. Yeah. Last question. On your Super Bowl trophy from your rookie year, you had it engraved the phrase, sky's the limit. Mm -hmm. What would you tell your rookie self standing where you are now? Buy Bitcoin. (laughs) (laughs) i love it no i would um you know i don't i would tell my rookie self whenever you think you've done enough do more going back to me always just priding myself on hard work and and putting the time and effort in now i look back and say well i probably could have did more right and it's not a it's not a complaint of saying I'm upset about my station in life, but, you know, just understanding how precious life is and the opportunities that we have and really just maximizing them. And you know what? That would be specifically what I would tell myself. So cancel that. Enjoy it. Enjoy the ride. Enjoy the people. Enjoy the experience, you know, because it went fast. Those eight years literally flew by. I would tell my younger self to do that more. And, you know, you'll probably listen to this and think like, man, this guy's just always about working, work, work, work. And so I would tell my younger self to enjoy it and take time to smell the roses because, you know, what I used to do, it became very normalized in saying, all right, well, you know, I'm getting ready to play against the Baltimore Ravens this week. And, oh, yeah, I went to the Super Bowl. Yeah, no big deal, right? But, like, people dream about that and they would do a lot of strange things to to be some of the places that I've been. I played in damn near every NFL stadium and I did a camp at Soldier Field two years ago uh, where we had about 300 uh, underserved kids from the south side of Chicago on the field and you know they're snapping pictures and walking in. They didn't go into the home team locker. They went to the visitors locker room and just thought it was the coolest thing ever. And here I am thinking like, man, it's just a visitor's locker room, like no big deal. So really just appreciating those experiences and having a level of empathy and understanding like what you did was not normal. So really take time to appreciate it and understand what it means and enjoy it. Ryan, thanks for everything uh, you shared. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Feel like a teammate. Yeah. Yeah, this was a good talk, man. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been great. I appreciate you. There are comprehensive show notes and links to everything and everyone mentioned in this episode at thebigjumpshow.com. If you're listening while driving or perhaps juggling fire, don't worry because everything and everyone discussed is all for you on the website with comprehensive show notes. Just go to thebigjumpshow.com and we've got you covered. Along those lines, I want this podcast to become its best. And I learned from sports that feedback is love and improves performance. So give me some feedback. I want to create better content for you. So tell me what you liked. Tell me what could be better. The Big Jump is on Instagram and Twitter, both at Big Jump Show. And leave a quick review on Apple Podcasts because it helps get the word out about the mission to inspire someone's next big jump. And remember to subscribe if you like what you hear and might want more. There's a lot more in store for season one of The Big Jump and beyond. I want to say thank you to our sponsor, Grand Voyage, a luxury fashion brand and a personal favorite of mine that makes shoes and bags designed in LA and handcrafted in Italy. GQ says they're, quote, changing the fashion game. And I always say, if you're changing up your game, you better look the part. So use promo code THEBIGJUMP for $35 off the beautiful bags and shoes from Grand Voyage. 
By the way, my favorite item has got to be the blue burnished leather high tops, which are handcrafted in Tuscany, Italy. So go check them out. See what I mean. Yes, blue leather high tops. Go to thebigjumpshow.com slash shoes. And from there, as they say, the rest is up to you. This is The Big Jump, a podcast about human reinvention, featuring pro athletes who have leveraged their athletic minds for success beyond sports.